Hey, welcome to Dirk Island. This is the weekend show where we watch interesting documentaries and talk about them. Monkeys went from the forest across like the power lines, you know, and, and came over and then... Did they you know, see you at a bag of something? Yeah, they, the they're kind of just like scoping out people from all over. So then it's basically <laughs> like I was assaulted and I felt this huge force on the bag on me. And then all of a sudden I see a small little, you know monkey with all four arms and legs <laughs> wrapped around this bag of groceries and I was so at first it felt like I was in some sort of human on human assault of some sort and then all of a sudden it's a monkey that's trying to take my groceries by hanging off of it and so I yanked the thing the monkey comes off and then I just freaking ran, <laughs> ran away from and that I, I like a foot tall monkey yeah it's like it's like one to two feet tall wow documentary is Jane by National Geographic and it's uh, new this year but all the footage is or most of the footage is recovered from the 1960s and the first thing that stands out is how beautiful the recovery of the film was or the, the remastering of the film I thought oh Watching yeah really it, awesome really dreamlike yes the colors are it's almost like the most incredible early Instagram filter put <laughs> on the documentary at least the the early days of her going to um, is it Gambia Gambi Gambi I believe Gambi uh, the early days of her going to Gambi with this lush green and seeing the chimps in the wild and just an incredible um, just incredible to watch for the color purposes yeah yeah really wa watchable almost hyper real which I thought did justice to how beautiful it must be to actually be there and Jane Goodall herself looks like she's out of a storybook I mean she looked like Jane going into the jungle to meet Tarzan to me yeah um, almost almost storybook like which I thought was pretty cool and she's definitely uh, a character within this documentary and you immediately notice and they talk about it she was a character even from the very first time she went to Africa she was kind of a, a character within it it wasn't just an objective observation of the chimps yes uh, the one of the most interesting things looking at this whole documentary overall is that you realize that a lot of the footage if not all of the footage was taken by her uh, former husband who mm -hmm. she met during the um, during the exhibition and he was a very famous photographer and through his entire life one of the most famous wildlife photographers of the Serengeti spent a lot of his time filming all sorts of animals but met her was a, was the National Geographic photographer slash videographer assigned to go watch her doing her discoveries with chimps in the wild and it's clear, and she says this in the beginning, that she was part of the focus. That this essentially very attractive, young, uh, blonde British lady who just wanted to get close to the chimps is actually succeeding at this and showing things about them using tools and about how their society is run and about mothering in the wild mm -hmm. that people didn't necessarily think at the time that chimps were capable of. And it's great and compelling and there's even a lot of self-awareness that she was this blonde beauty in the wild with these chimps and th a lot of people criticized her for that the mm -hmm. only reason this is interesting is because she's attractive and this is what we're looking at these are what these photogra photographs are which is definitely not the case but it is funny to see mm -hmm. it uh, that that was part of how they sold it and part of her fame which has uh, led to a lot of really great things for the causes she cares about but um, seeing that all from inception and also seeing it a bit from the eyes of the guy who was basically filming her as he was probably falling in love with her and then you know at the end of his first three month trip asks her to marry him and mm -hmm. it's kind of like, oh, you're. this is part of what we're watching here. We're not only watching Jane Goodall in the early days in the wild with the, um, with the chimpanzees. We're watching the footage of this shot from the man who's clearly sent there to do his work and then kind of 
captivated by her so much so that he ends up wanting to marry her. Mm -hmm. And you see that in a very raw way, and it's it's a really interesting uh, perspective that you pretty much never get behind the camera. You know that's mm -hmm. what's happening behind the camera, and that's part of the reason just her kind of strolling along, you know, shots that he's taking for whatever reason, yeah. Yeah, almost more enamored with her yeah. than with the environment and the chimpanzees. I like it, and that was a cool, fun fact and perspective I hadn't had, which was she was kind of an appealing choice in that she was chosen to go to Africa and film and observe the chimpanzees. I've always thought of her and known her as Dr. Jane Goodall, and I thought her credentials and her academic research pre pre preceded her going to Africa. I didn't realize that she was actually a secretary of a prominent researcher of apes, the only one really at the time, who picked her to go to Africa. And at the time, she was pretty much credentialless, uh, didn't have any degrees, um, especially in the area, which was an interesting thing to learn that I don't think is widely known. Yes, for sure. And she was uh, unbiased, which she plays Yeah, there as was an a asset. reason. There was a valid reason for him to do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, at the time, there were prevailing wisdoms about what chimps were like, what animals were like in general, and how that related to humans. And she happened to be the secretary of a researcher who decided that maybe actually chimps are a little bit more complex. And by looking into some of that complexity, we can find out what some of our early human ancestors might have acted like. Mm -hmm. So there was someone who had an alternate theory, but he chose her, uh, at least because she wouldn't be running against any sort of predisposition. She very much was had her own opinions of what chimps were like. And I would say that's also part of the interesting drama of the documentary. If it was just the first 20 minutes, if it was just Jane and the chimps in the wild, it would definitely be a very compelling watch, but it wouldn't keep your attention much more than 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But her really learning about chimps and learning about her life too and the course of learning about this is the compelling part of this because there's a lot of drama and there's a lot of assumptions being overcome but in her case it's not i have a research background of what what animals are supposed to be like or chimps are supposed to be like and i need to overcome that it's about her having almost a dream like idyllic version mm -hmm. of what the chimps are like back originally mm -hmm. and what that means about humans she says at one point in time you know originally i thought chimps were essentially like humans except a little bit nicer and uh, over time, that version, that early version of what she believed erodes away. And yeah. even even the fact that she would go there without much protection would go on her own uh, yeah. journey. Unaware of that they could were dangerous, could potentially you know rip her face off and show express violent behavior like that. And all of the, those all of that portion of chimps, which also leads also to that insight into what early humans might have been mm -hmm. like. Uh, is revealed over time. And so it's not all that, uh, oh, we're very much like chimps because they have reason or depression or, or important relationships or social behaviors. It's also looking at um, chimps are uh, violent and fight over resources that were unearned. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was one of the more interesting parts of seeing just the chaos that ensues. She's very, they, they, at the beginning, they're very interested in making any chimps just get close to them. So when some chimp comes and takes a few bananas from them, they're enamored by it. They're thinking, oh, that's so great. We just got to now set up the camera. And when they come back for more bananas, um, we'll get much closer to them and it's really fun at first and then that lasts for a very short amount of time until all the chimps realize there are free bananas coming and chaos ensues they're then they have to seek shelter sometimes because chimps are essentially warring with each other over some found resource some unearned resource that no one knew was there two seconds ago now that it's there everyone descends into chaos and that's the that's the theme of so many hollywood movies that exist right <laughs> Someone finds something, you know, like a, a pile of money or whatever, or some resource, and, and not even just movies, all, a lot of human history mm -hmm. is over some unearned resource that people all, all of a sudden discover, and now they descend into chaos fighting over it with each other. And it's just an interesting thing to 
uh, every time she realizes something about how the chimps react to something, you know, as the viewer and as her too, over time, you're seeing, oh, well, this is telling us something. This is looking very human. Yes. Yeah, her research is so fascinating, and therefore the documentary is so interesting because it has, it's just a great animal nature documentary in itself. Uh, for people who love that, which I do, it has that kind of planet Earth element, but everything has implications for, you know, evolutionary psychology, which I love. And I also, it was fascinating how there were these preconceived notions about chimpanzees and how that reflected on human psychology. And I liked how her initial findings were immediately a threat to the institutional knowledge, the first of which we thought humans are the only tool using animals. That is something that distinguishes us. And she sees a a chimpanzee use a stick and stick it into a termite hill and pull it off and use it to eat them. And immediately people think, what is she doing? She must be, you know, not meticulous in her observations or it, it was a threat and they almost don't want to receive the knowledge that she's, you know, just unbiasedly reporting. Yeah, it's so funny because... and. People don't understand, I think, sometimes why uh, humans being the first to use tools could be such a threatening thing to over to override. And mm-hmm. it's because some people theorize things like, oh, well, the reason people stand up on two legs is because they needed to use tools, so they needed two free hands. Or the reason they have big brains is because they were they once they stood up on two legs, then they were using tools, and then the brains developed from there. And it's like, wait, okay, so if chimps can do it, then why didn't the brains and why didn't the two hands... Mm-hmm. It's like, it just... It just it throws out the cart, and people are so threatened by anything, threatened by learning, which mm-hmm. is hilarious to see. You yeah. Because, I mean, I love thinking about these areas and these issues and the, the stuff, especially of the near human animal ancestors mm-hmm. versus, you know, very far animal ancestors. But seeing the uh, humanity in any animal um, can be a threat to the establishment. Yeah. And usually there are a few common arguments too. Like one, we love to personify animals. Like we love mm-hmm. to say our dog is depressed when maybe that's not at all and it's just, you True. know, it has a thing in its eye and it's not actually crying, there's nothing happening. But the other thing is that, uh, you know, you, you don't realize why some people stake so much on humans being so special in mm-hmm. certain ways. And it's, funny to see humans not being special and then in in a certain way or at least animals sharing more in common with us than people were giving them credit for before Mm -hmm. and then having that uh, instead of highlighting something good about humans or special highlighting you know something that is so uh, primitive about humans even Mm -hmm. today and also beyond that it it gets to a a big theme in science, which is the irony that there is an orthodoxy to scientific research, which seems counter to what it should be. Scientific inquiry should be constantly open to reevaluation, and in theory, everything that's established is up for challenge and is supposed to be scrutinized with additional research. And it's weird that she's out there conducting observations and you find that there is an orthodoxy, which if you've gone to a university, you you quickly learn. But it's a deep irony, I think, in science. It's just that there would be an inherent pushback even as opposed to a curiosity. Let's investigate. To the contrary, there are other scientists who go, well, if we accept that she's not full of shit, then I might have to, you know, not be famous because I came up with this, you know, theory about how the brains grew when we started using tools, which Mm -hmm. is just obviously wrong now that there's concrete evidence that's flying in the face of that. Or it's not, maybe it's not obviously wrong, but maybe you don't have to, it doesn't have to be all the way one way. Maybe stone tools are materially different than stick tools, you Mm, know, but maybe that would undercut some sort, someone else's observation who was saying, oh, well, some, some group didn't have stone tools, but they developed and some group did but they you know it's just like, you're right i shouldn't say obviously wrong i just mean the instinct is ironic they should have you would think they would always be curious about yeah. new information rather than have a reflex of of just denying it 
Well, I mean, I think about this. We're we're a little off topic, but it does it does go into the early human development topic. And someone finds a skull fragment recently. This happened within the last few years. Skull fragment in a, a mine near Morocco, mm-hmm. and uh, that if it's human, it was three hundred thousand years old, uh, carbon dated, and if it's human, that is a challenge to the idea of uh, humans, perhaps first showing up, homo sapiens, perhaps first showing up in an area near Ethiopia mm. um, originally, if there was, and that, that would have been about 150,000 years ago. If 300,000 years ago there was a homo sapien skull that was found in um, near Morocco, that would, that is a problem. So that, for based on our what we think yes. right now. So you either need to say, well, it wasn't in Ethiopia, or it wasn't human, or it was. Mm. You know, if it's a chimp in in Morocco, uh, chimp could chimps existed, or some other prehuman ancestor existed. I mean, Neanderthals were in Europe way longer than three hundred thousand years ago, I believe. But um, but a Homo sapien was not in was supposedly only about 150,000 years ago and originated somewhere near Ethiopia or more more mm. central to uh, central eastern Africa. And there could be uh, multiple points of homo sapiens becoming a species, like it doesn't have to necessarily be only one. There's that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. But and they interbreed well to become <sighs> us or just uh, independent evolution to what is a homo sapien from mm-hmm. multiple places and then kind of mixing together into a unified homo sapien type group of some sort but the ideally being that, that a, a homo sapien or any species doesn't necessarily only need to evolve in a single spot it's, this is not easy science but the the whole idea is that you don't have that if you find a skull fragment in Morocco that mm-hmm. you know is 300,000 years ago and we believe in carbon dating and that's not fucked up, then that <laughs> either needs to be a uh, non human, a non homo sapien. Homo sapien is what I really mean because some pe- a lot of people say that human Neanderthals are human also, mm-hmm. uh, or other humanoid species are human, but homo sapien is the species that we are. Um, non homo sapien in Morocco. Or what we believed before is possibly wrong. And Mm. there are discoveries that really make it so that not both of those things can be correct at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and usually people are like, well, I'm just not sure yet. We we really need more evidence. I mean, I really think this could be the case. Or how how are these both the case? Perhaps a multiple evolution. Perhaps there were people in Morocco. Perhaps our earlier date of 150,000 years is just the earliest fragments we've found, but isn't actually the earliest that they existed. But the earlier ones disintegrated for some reason. A lot of explanations, but it, mm-hmm. but you can figure out things that just mean that what you were operating on before is not going to last any longer. Yeah. I mean, something that I was surprised by that I did feel was more uniquely human was the ability to be afflicted by emotional pain. I, I found it fascinating how Flo, the matriarch of the, of the chimpanzee, tribe that she was following her son was once she died went through a depression and ended up dying himself and that was something i before watching this documentary pretty much assumed was a uniquely human thing the idea of going through a depression and a depression killing a middle-aged or youthful male uh going into disease basically losing the will to live that sort of imperfection and lack of survival skill i thought was unique to humans i mean it's he didn't commit suicide but it was almost it was a dysfunction of the primal will to live which i thought was a uniquely human thing and that was bizarre to see uh, that she observed in the wild Mm -hmm. i mean i think that so there are two things that makes me think of. One is the effect of humans. So we know that we had, um, for example, Keiko, the uh, the the uh, orca that was the star of Free Willy the movie, and they had that animal and it became loved by a lot of people. But then it spent the rest of its life trying to be in various um, aquariums, eventually bigger, eventually to a part in the ocean, and then eventually released, trying to get it into reintegrated with some pod. 
and eventually it just couldn't happen. You know that that mm -hmm. orca died in the wild, and uh, with it, with this animal, this specific animal uh, who was named Flint, who's the son of Flo, who Jane knew from the early days and watched him when he was just newly born. I I do have a slight wonder if because of the circumstance, because they had so much interaction with humans, because they were um, getting things like bananas at routine times, I do wonder if that just changes the nature of a chimp into something more like a human um, mm. in the in the uh, things are provided. You know, it isn't pure wild anymore if you have a banana show up. I mean, it, it just isn't. Right, and there are mm -hmm. there are animals that live in cities, and they eat our trash, and they take you know there there are lots of rodents and things like that. There are uh, stray cats and dogs who survive. It's not it's not fully in the wild in a way that um, a chimp be without any connection to humans. So the fact that we see depression, we see things that we recognize in humans, um, is also perhaps. Uh, something because they are being exposed yeah. to all the things we've created as humans, uh, providing things and then taking them away. Mm -hmm. And w the reason that he died is because he kind of had didn't have the will to feed himself anymore. He was so into being around his mom, a certain level of dependency that I'm not sure is exists, and it's not totally clear. I'm sure that if there's anyone on Earth, the people who are the researchers at her institute, the Jane Goodall Foundation and Institute and everything they've got going, I'm sure they are um, as good as it gets in this specific area. But it's still hard to understand whether or not a certain uh, single chimp like that dying is representative of all chimps or if that chimp was somehow special because of his relationship to people um, mm -hmm. cl since the very early ages of his life. Very plausible, and they don't go over that much, the idea that uh, she could have, how much she and her crew affected the behavior of the chimps. You know, by the mere act of trying to observe, she affected the subject in the process. They do kind of go over that in the first when they start introducing the bananas, and it starts calmly. A few chimpanzees wander into the camp and take bananas, and then it quickly becomes groups and hordes and lots of interspecies competition and she does seem to acknowledge that was a situation she caused but later in the documentary when she's been with them for years and Flo the matriarch dies they descend into two packs and there's this equivalent of warfare and one group that split off from the main group is completely eradicated by the others and there's not much discussion of the possibility that maybe this warlike behavior was something created by them and the providing of food it's true i mean it's possible i i do doubt it though i mean one of the things that that's used for and why that is looked on is that uh, apes do essentially commit genocide against other rival ape tribes. You know they kill they observe them. it in other contexts without the influence of the observer. No bananas. I believe so. I don't know for yeah. certain. But the 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 significance of what they witness after that after the matriarch dies and there's a separation of two groups and one essentially portion of the separated group. Uh, wipes out the other through a, a type of what they call primitive warfare it looks like mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a real shock to Jane Goodall as she expresses this in the movie because a lot of people assumed that warfare was a uniquely human thing mm -hmm. that we were the ones who cooked up this these atrocities we were the, we are the ones who've cooked up things like genocide and I um, being someone who's watched enough nature documentaries, I do not have that view of nature, but I also have the benefit of watching probably a lot more nature by the time this time in my life because of nature documentaries mm -hmm. than a lot of people have ever had, you know, before our our era. See? So when I look <laughs> at nature documentaries and when I look at nature after seeing all this, I don't see a uh, a blissful existence as our as nature. I see nature, uh, although I love it and am fascinated by what happens, I see it as a an endless cycle of violence and chaos. And nature really exists on 
a, a, a large number of species um, thinking every day about how they get their next kill mm -hmm. and a large number of species thinking about how they survive that and even within species a large number of them thinking about how they uh, elbow out another um, to get a little bit more themselves and that is much that is pretty clear beyond humans uh, just looking at the totality of what can be seen in nature documentaries and all the aggression and and injustice if you're really thinking that justice applies the injustices that are uh, the norm not the exception in a state of nature and then so to think that war is something uniquely human. The only thing I think uniquely human about war is that we get enough people to be peaceful together and to coordinate to go after enough other people who have been peaceful and coordinating up until that culminating moment. Whereas in a state of nature, war is a is a, a solo practice in many cases, or a herd versus herd, and it's an every. It's so common, the senseless and brutal violence that happened that we associate with war is so common in nature that it seems unremarkable. It seems like calling it war would be uh, mm -hmm. almost too grand, but just to think about what, what it looks like for a single species, you know, like a lion, for example, to pick out the, uh, the baby of a mother of another species who is not running fast and to kill that. While the, and the pain that that mother feels and the, the br brutalness that a lion would do to not only uh, kill the baby of another one, but specifically target the baby of that because the baby is easier to take down and to kill and to get away. And that is what nature is. And to think that we have figured out how to be the most brutal is to ignore, I feel like, what nature really is like. Yeah, it, but it, but also there is a com complexity in the chimpanzees that I think is almost on a gradient from the rest of of uh, nature, which is a little more distant from us in our behavior, and they do really feel like a link uh, between kind of certain animals that are le we identify less with, and then the chimpanzees that the way they wage warfare and the loyalties you know we it, you see in the beginning how they form bonds that are much like us they have social relationships and sexual relationships that seem complex and family units and hierarchies that feel uh, more human than normal and then to see the way they wage war and how the war was started from the death of a matriarch almost like you know in a human way the death of a king or the de death of a leader and that causing chaos and then uh, a breakup of the group and then warfare started it was it was more organized than uh, I would imagine the the chaos of other species which was fascinating and even if I have to say even if she did influence it them getting the bananas made them more prone to a warfare type scenario it's still fascinating because and, and you're still learning that they're complex enough to express that behavior mm -hmm. similar to she and it seems like she laid the groundwork for this kind of thing nowadays they're doing studies where they give uh, m monkeys or chimpanzees pieces of food as a currency you know and they've and they've taught uh, different ape, ape species to use food as a currency and designed experiments and even though we're totally creating that scenario it's still just as fascinating that mm. they're even capable of expressing such behavior yes. and realizing that even a thing such as a currency while native to us as a species isn't um, specific to our biology yeah I mean it is interesting I, I've you know, had a few times where I've been around monkeys and heard about them, and the you know they're monkeys, they're not apes, but um, yeah, not to conflate yeah, the two, yeah, but I just but, they, I think they have done research with both. Yeah, and but it's it's pretty clear, you know, monkeys will take your shit, and <laughs> the the truth about it is that the complex part is if they just took your shit so they could eat it for themselves, that would be. That's one level of complexity. That's like a lion killing a baby of whatever, you know, just for, for sustenance. But the thing that monkeys and apes have that is does a little bit separate them from some of the stuff you see with whatever is uh, the, the second step thinking. Whereas you can go to a place 
and see a monkey um, in the wild, you know, if you go to a, uh, you know, one of those places where you can interact, sometimes they'll take your shit, but for the purpose of you want it back, so they will, you know, basically holding it hostage oh my, in a way. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, so I feel like I've heard of that and forgotten about it. That yeah. blows my mind though. Like they'll steal your shit, hold it hostage and know like if you give me a banana, I'll give you your bag back. Yeah. Yeah. Or your water <laughs> bottle. Also, but she says this in the documentary. They, they proved themselves very quickly to be completely unscrupulous or uh, thieves. immoral thieves. Yeah. Yeah, where they're just taking their sh- their tents apart and like taking their dishware and all these supplies they'd actually use just so they can just <laughs> sit around and chew on them and rip them. It's like it makes no sense. But quickly turns into mayhem the second they yeah, get comfortable just like, with the humans. Uh, they are very you know they're much stronger than humans and I, it's unclear if they oh. know that, but they're uh, they, yeah they definitely could rip them apart. I don't know. I thought I think there is something about the 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 warfare element that you see later in the film that is especially fascinating about especially her realizing that this is not uniquely human this idea of war. But there is something that is a little bit that humans and chimps share that I'm not so sure is expressed as much in other types of animals which is the idea that you would go to war over one group versus another as opposed to the type of violence that I was describing, which is just senseless violence for Mm -hmm. food or, or survival. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fascinating complex emotions that are expressed and captured on film that go more to the idea of chimps doing things for reasons other than survival. Mm -hmm. That there's a, there's a level that is, uh, that how people interact that is not totally related to survival and replication. I mean, even the fact that the main woman, when she's essentially ready to have a child, she just seems to go to the center of camp and get, you know, gang banged, raped, whatever you'd call it, by all of the other um, did, monkeys. Yeah, or all the other chimps in the in the group. And someone might say, well, that maybe gives her the best, best potential to have a child. But the one thing that is interesting, and I would say separates humans from chimpanzees, but there's a caveat. But the one thing I would say possibly separates them is that humans are one of the only species that decides about replication. You know? Decides when and how and what and to. There, it, it seems to be that way. And that seems to be a very big difference, even, you know, uh, to that replication is just almost taken for granted and life in a way is just taken for granted by chimpanzees and just what they do doesn't seem to be so i don't know what i'm saying and something about that scene though specifically where the one of the 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 alpha female is in heat and then she goes to the center of camp and every male is is able to sleep you know have sex with her yeah take their turn from behind and jane observed that her daughter was super upset by it and you see it on the camera you can't help but identify human emotions in them that's just how you naturally observe their behavior and i thought that was weird and it was disturbing just as if it was a human drama but in a more fucked up way because you can't help but think of the human equivalent but i thought that was so bizarre um, to just see, a, you know, a child basically being upset at their parents' sexual behavior and choices. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's strange. The other thing that I felt is very upsetting and is also very well done throughout the movie is this idea of the, the main matriarch, uh, chimpanzee who we follow, uh, is, you know, at the time she's ready to have a child, she basically has it with whoever's available. Mm -hmm. And then she has her child, and her child is uh, with her, but it doesn't... And she's very good mother in a way, very loving, but doesn't... um, There doesn't appear to be much male influence in a way. There doesn't appear to be much co-parenting in this scenario. And I would say that is an opportunity that humans have and often do express that... uh, doesn't didn't appear present in this case where mm. the parenting from the father side seems to be completely absent and almost unnecessary in that society the chimpanzee society 
Except what's so interesting about this documentary, if looked at in a certain way, is that Jane Goodall's story, in a way, mirrors this kind of reality, where she uh, goes, she's not really interested in having a child. She goes and does this thing that's her passion, this mm. work. She, uh, she falls in love with the photographer, somewhat, you know, happenstance, and then she, um, then she has a child with him, and then there's a lot of separation involved mm -hmm. with that. And there, and uh, I don't know. It was very interesting how her own uh, observation of a of a of a chimpanzee, or maybe that's the documentary and how it was told, uh, mirrors in a way her own life to, to certain elements, at least. Definitely. I thought that was fascinating the way she uh, and and it was it was interesting how she talked about the prevailing perception about parenting at the time and how uh, over giving too much affection to a to an infant was thought of to make them over dependent and she through her observations thought no it's actually the quite the opposite you can give an excessive amount of love and support and affection to an infant and by the time they start maturing into you know an older uh, you know five or six year old or whatever they have the comfort and security to go off and, and express independence healthily yeah it was really good I, I so, like it so there was the final line which is uh, essentially you know I've always kind of believed you know in the the term before the fault's not in our stars but in ourselves and you know you gotta work hard and she essentially says yes for my whole life I have believed that generally. I have worked very hard to get to where I am, um, but I can't help but think that the stars might have been looking out for me, or the stars might have aligned in a way that was a little bit, um, that allowed it all to happen. And that is very much an imp impression you get while watching this, where she definitely is a compelling figure to have at the center. Mm -hmm. She, through just knowing about her generally, is a bit of an idol in the animal um, welfare movements and any anyone who's ever done anything for animals on this earth kind of thinks highly or at least uh, knows there's a certain place of respect for her because she has, you know, no one can abdicate for every animal all the time, but she has definitely... Um, advocated for an understanding and a respect for chimpanzees in this earth and that extends to how they're used in Hollywood I mean you could I don't know if you can trace it directly but the fact that a movie now like Planet of the Apes is going to use only CGI for its apes and everyone's okay with that I mean thankfully with the technology but that versus what where we might have been just 20 years ago when they might have considered actually using real apes but just the amount of animals used in television she's had an impact on that and uh i think that she is she's she's accomplished accomplished so much that but there is a an element of fortune that um she she was the right person for her moment and also she was fortunate to, to have a few incredible moments to really um, capitalize on. Yeah, she's lucky as hell, I think. Yeah. I mean, that she got that opportunity in the first place and to be, and I, I think that makes her very likable, that she seems to be so, feel that she was fortunate and be so grateful for getting the opportunity in the first place and being able to be funded to stay out in Africa and basically be the chosen one of this group of chimps and get to do it first. Um, it makes her a likable person, and mm -hmm. you know she she took it and ran with it. But yeah, she doesn't have any sense of ego or anything. She feels very purely driven by her love of nature and animals, and advocating for them, which I liked a lot. But yeah, I wish I was her, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> or I just w I would I would love I feel I felt a I felt an element of enviousness just that she got to live that life and experience that connection with a group of animals. Yeah, but she and she did, but she has. She definitely she had has, to pay the price and work hard. I mean, she had to live in Africa for. She had to live in Africa. She had to have um, a marriage that fell apart. Mm -hmm. She had to. Uh, give her child away to go to regular school because there was absolutely no way he could be socialized with her lifestyle 
and she says that every day since 1986 she hasn't spent more than three weeks in one place and that's be that has to be a sacrifice although it's also an incredible opportunity to have such a platform where you can have that lifestyle where you can go around and give speeches raise money do whatever you're doing for your causes but um, that would remove you from a certain level of consistency that uh, most people get to experience in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be hard on your social relationships. It would be hard on pretty much every aspect of your life. And yet the life that she has pursued and also the life that she fell into and so well uh, pursued has enabled her to and kind of chosen her to be this person who must do what she's done to really take full advantage of it. And it seems like she really has. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I, I, I thought it was a great documentary, and I think the subject matter is endlessly interesting. Yeah. And uh, it was cool to kind of get the origin story and put her work into context of how trend-setting it was, how there really wasn't anything before her that had explored uh, chimpanzees and apes and their connection and what it means about us. Yeah, I think I've heard good things about this documentary. I um, I thought it was m more impressive than I, I expected it to be. I thought just oh, cool. a, a, from a watch, it was mm -hmm. more impressive. Anyway, do you have anything else to say? No. Okay. <sighs> Thanks very much for watching us. Please subscribe on YouTube if you want to keep up and learn about more documentaries that we're watching. And also, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts if you want to listen to the audio version. Thanks very much. Thanks.